Okay, we're going to start an expository study of 2 Timothy. I went through the whole uh, book of 1 Timothy, so now we're going to go verse by verse through 2 Timothy. So if you want to go in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Of course, you need to be using a King James Version for this sermon to make sense. So, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Did you ever have anybody tell you to get a life? You know? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a Christian, you have the ultimate life. Pretty interesting. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, if you remember from the first expository there, it says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Okay? Not only are you going to have a good life in eternity, but you can also have the ultimate life right now. Okay? You know, Joel Osteen tries to say your best life now, and you look at his book, and it's the best life without Jesus Christ, without a truly changed life as a as a repentant sinner coming to God for salvation. That's not your best life now. Charismatic prosperity gospel is not your best life. All right. If you're saved and you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. Your best life that you have is having that assurance of eternity in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that your sins are paid for. That's your best life now. And you might go through sickness, you might go through poverty, you might go through all kinds of things, and yet you can still have joy because of the promise of the life that we're going to get and that we have right now, too. John chapter 12, verse 25, Jesus says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. See, when you're lost out there in the world, you have a certain type of life that you're living. The course of the world, the way things go in the world. And you have to get to a point where you give that life up to become a Christian. All right? It's just the way it is. You know, you have to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. But it's interesting because the lost world likes this. They like to try and pervert and steal this thing, you know, from the Bible. You know, we, we're the ones that have the real life. And the lost world comes along and they say, this is the life. Did you ever hear that? Ah, oh, man, this is the life. Ah. Oh. Somebody's at the beach or in the mountains or at some resort someplace, and they say, this is the life. Uh, no, it isn't. How about Miller High Life? You know, yeah, there you go. Getting drunk and things like that, rolling around in your own vomit. That's the Miller High Life. Sure it is. How about you ever hear the uh, expression, somebody says, I'm just loving life. Just loving life. Uh, usually that means that they're a sinner, and they're getting away with sins, at least they think. And things are going pretty good for now, and they're just loving life. Uh, usually people that say that are totally without Christ. At least the people I've known. They don't have that true life that a Christian has. How about this one? Life is good. Do you ever hear lost people say life is good? Well, uh, for many of them, it's the life that they have is good compared to their eternity that they have coming up. Uh, an eternity in hell is a horrible thing. I'm not trying to mock lost people. I'm just trying to mock people that just reject Jesus Christ and don't want, to, don't want anything to do with the Lord and make fun of Christians and the Bible and whatever else. You know, you'll get my scorn. You'll get my sarcasm. But if you're lost and you're watching this video, you need to understand that uh, you're never going to have the kind of life that you need to have here in this world uh, without Jesus Christ. And especially into eternity, you're not going to have the kind of life you need to live in eternity unless you get saved. And that salvation is there for you. All you have to do is just be a sinner. So, huh? I thought you mean, you know, I thought you have to be a good person to go to heaven. No, you have to be a bad person to go to heaven. A rotten person. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Are you a sinner? You say, well, I, I, I'm not that bad. Well, then you aren't going to go to heaven. You have to come to the point where you give up your self-righteousness and thinking that you're going to be good enough to get to heaven. Give that up. Because then and only then are you ready to accept the perfect payment for sins that Jesus Christ paid on the cross. People have a funny notion that they have to be good to get to heaven. No, Jesus Christ did that for you. What you have to do is become bad. <laughs> Admit 
be honest enough to admit that you're a bad person. And that, yeah, you do deserve hell, but you'd really like to go to heaven. And then you put your faith in Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, verse 6. You ought to know this one if you're a Bible believer. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the life. Now, let me ask you a question. Since you've been saved, if you say I'm a Christian, has Jesus changed your life? Read Second Chronicle or Second Corinthians, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. Okay, you're supposed to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. John chapter twenty, verses thirty and thirty-one says, "And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book." But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Notice it's life through the name of Jesus. It's not life through membership in the Catholic Church. Or life in membership in your local independent fundamental Baptist church. Uh, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. I don't care what church you're part of. I don't care what organization you're part of. I don't care if you've been a good person, if you've given money to charity. I don't care what you've done. If you're not named by the name of Jesus Christ, a Christian, real one, you know, if you're not there, you're not saved. Very simple. Acts chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. It says here, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. There's a good one for you. How's that for the modern Christians with all the prosperity and everything else? Here you get these two guys there in prison, you know, and the Lord comes in, breaks them out of jail, and says, Go on down to the temple. That would have been, yeah, that would have been Peter. And you know, he says, Peter, I think, I, I can't remember, Peter and John, I think, but they, you know, he goes, you know, go down to the temple and tell them all the words of this life. But what's the this life? You know, these guys go down and say, hey, Jesus just broke us out of prison. We're here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. You know, wow. How's that for a life? It's a good one. Second Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through, I believe it's 12, yeah, 8 through 12. It says here, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Hmm. You mean you can have a good life while being persecuted? A good life while having people coming after you trying to kill you? Yeah. That's the best, the, the best life, you know. A life that Joel Osteen knows nothing about. With his little, silly little book, Your Best Life Now. He doesn't know. He, he's never even experienced it. You know? Uh, there was a, his little stadium there, his sports stadium that they were going to meet in and all this stuff. I remember reading in his book, uh, Your Best Life Now, he talked about how that they had to go to court for years and years to, to you know, win that building that they meet in. And I thought to myself, uh-huh. I wonder what would happen to old smiley Joel Olstein if he was reduced to nothing. Total economic collapse, you know, and, and he was reduced to being homeless on the street. How much joy do you think he'd have? How many smiles do you think he'd have on his face? None. And his wife there, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> They'd be screaming and cursing and, you know, cutting themselves with stones and whatever else. Devil possessed, devil possessed people do. Second Timothy chapter one verse two. We'll go on to verse two now. 
Okay, it says here, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, let me ask you a question. Where would you be in this life if it wasn't for God's grace, mercy, and peace? Hmm. Interesting. Another question. When was the last time you thanked God for that? For His grace, for His mercy, and for the peace that He provides you? The Bible says that we're to give thanks in all things. You know, it's, it's awfully easy. You get to the end of a day and you've really had no sickness or no, you know, really difficult times. You just, you know, you were busy, you had things to do and whatever else. It's easy to forget to thank God for taking care of you. Usually when you start praying about your health, it's because things are going wrong, you know. And you say, are you talking to me, Ryan? I'm talking about myself. There are many times I'll pray to the Lord and, and Lord, please take this headache away. Please take this sickness away, whatever. And he does. And I forget to thank him. It's something to stay in practice. Thank God for his grace, his mercy, and for the peace that he gives you as a Christian. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 3 through 5 says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Okay, notice there in verse 4 it says about that Paul is mindful of his tears, of Timothy's tears. Uh, well, it sounds to me like Timothy's starting to have a pretty rough time in ministry. It sounds like uh, he's getting kicked around a little bit. And that's what's going to happen to you when you become a preacher. Uh, you're going to get kicked. And sometimes it's going to be by the brethren and they're going to kick harder than the lost. Uh, it's, it can get rough sometimes. And you need to have... You know, that's something else that, that a lot of times we forget about. Sometimes it's good to exhort brethren and to say, hey, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing. Keep it up. I see how you're getting kicked. I see how you're getting attacked. Keep it up. I try to do that with people and try to encourage the brethren. And uh, if, if you are doing some work for the Lord and you are getting kicked, be encouraged. You're on the right path. But uh, notice there it says in verse 5, too, about the unfeigned faith very interesting word. Uh, feigning something means you're faking it. And so unfeigned faith means it's real. It's not faked. Interesting there that Timothy had that. Now look at verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now if you want to see some of those things that Paul's talking about there, about you know the thing about him being a prisoner and, and some of the rough stuff you go through, you can watch our sermon about God's qualifications for the ministry. I get into a lot of it there. The, the kind of things that you can expect when you start to be in ministry you know, whether full-time or just, you know, on the side, any kind of ministry, you're going to get kicked, and you're going to get kicked hard sometimes. So prepare yourself for that. Uh, don't think that things are going to be easy. Okay, they're not. You're going to have a rough time sometimes. But, you know, stick with it. Uh, verse 9 says here, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, what is our holy calling according to Scripture? Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. You know, a lot of people kind of try to do their own thing, and, uh, you know, it doesn't work out a lot of times. You know, you got to look and see what talents the Lord has given you and then see how can I use these things for the Lord? Where can I best be used at? Um, that's something to think about. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, What? 
Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, we don't often think about that. We oftentimes kind of try to plan our own lives and we kind of say, you know, what do I want to do today? Or, you know, if you're married, you say, hey, honey, what do you, what do you want to do today? You know, and you don't often, sometimes you for, start to forget. It's not really so much about what do I want out of life, but what does God want me to do? You say, are you saying he owns us? Mm -hmm. Verse I just read there said, God owns you. You're bought with a price. See, that's something you have to think about if you're lost and you're watching this video. Um, when you get saved, you're going to be God's property. It isn't, you know, I get saved and I have, I have salvation now and I've, I've gotten this thing from God, this gift of salvation. Now I don't owe God anything. No, you owe him a changed life. You owe God the rest of your days here. You say, well, I know Christians that don't serve God. Yeah, and they go home and they get no rewards. These verses are for Christians that want to serve the Lord, that want to do something for the Lord. You know, you have to understand you are a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Right? You don't have your, the option of saying, I'm just going to do my own thing in life. Unless you want to go home without any rewards at all. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You can turn there. And I talked about this verse a little bit before, and we're going to hit it again. And, you know, I hit this verse a lot because a lot of people just don't seem to understand it. Uh, I get a lot of brethren out there that give me a lot of grief over this verse because I preach it. And uh, I'm going to continue preaching it until the Lord takes me out of here. Because it's scripture, and it's one of the most neglected um, things in our modern day, present uh, Christianity that we have today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You better be a new creature. You say, I, some, I know so-and-so, they got saved and they were drinking and a drunkard before they got saved and they still do the same thing afterwards. Then they didn't get saved. They're not a new creature. It's just that simple. Verse 18 and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And again, I go over those verses a lot too. But, it, you know, a lot of people don't get it. Your purpose here on this earth is God's committed unto you the ministry of reconciliation. All right? You are supposed to go out there as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're supposed to not only witness to the lost, but you're to stand up for this book right here. This King James Bible. All right? Very important that you stand for the Bible. You say, well, I stand for the NIV. I stand for the ESV. Don't waste your time on those. Those things come from the Vatican. All right? Documented fact, by the way. Not my opinion. All right? And you can watch some of the other videos on that if you're, if you're new to the issue. But the fact is, if you look in the footnotes a lot of times or even in the preface or something, they'll say about the, the two oldest and best manuscripts. Or they'll talk about the King James translators didn't have access to the two oldest and best manuscripts. And they won't tell you what those are a lot of times. But those two oldest and best manuscripts are, they're called codices, or codex, but the plural is codices. Um, B and Aleph. B as Vaticanus, excuse me, I'll get it out yet. And Aleph is Sinaiticus. Right? Those are the two supposed oldest and best manuscripts. They're full of corruptions. It's just horrible. But uh, the whole point is that text comes from the Vatican. You have the Nestle's text, a Jesuit cardinal, Carlo Maria Martini, sits on that, that uh, editor's board, board of editors there, for the Nestle's text. That's what your new version is coming from. And people say, well, what about Erasmus? Erasmus was a Catholic. Yes, and Erasmus died 
almost 100 years before the King James was translated. And Erasmus' text that he made was not used by the King James translators, not exclusively anyhow. And Erasmus' Greek Latin text was never used by the Catholic Church. So if he was a great Catholic scholar, wouldn't the Catholics have used his text? See? That's a whole other issue. But the point is, don't use anything other than the King James Bible. It's not too difficult to understand. Uh, I actually have a hard time understanding the new versions now that I'm a King James Bible believer. But continuing here, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and look at this, hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. All right? Are you living the kind of life that God has called you to live? I need to keep going back to that. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, you're not going to serve your life or serve the Lord Jesus Christ down here with your life. You're, you're not going to do that and end up getting to heaven and the Lord's going to say, Oh, hi, you know, welcome. And you say, So what do you think of what I did down there? Oh, oh no. Oh man, I, I can't find your file. I'm sorry, I can't give you any rewards. I mean, I, I don't know where the papers got to, you know, of your service for me. I, no, the Lord's not inept like man is. You know, man does that kind of thing. The Lord's not going to do that. The Lord is recording everything that you do, which is very good and it's also very scary. You know, a lot of times we're wasting time down here and the Lord's recording that. A lot of times you have opportunities to witness, opportunities to say something for Jesus Christ and you don't take it. Well, that's recorded. And, you know, I'm kicking myself here, right? There are many times I've had chances to witness and I didn't take it. And I speak that to my shame. And uh, that's something that we all have to work on. It's very important. But uh, the Lord is keeping that account so that He can reward you one day. The Lord does not keep accurate records on you so that you can one day make it to heaven if you work hard enough. You know, that, like the Catholics, they say, are you saved? They say, I am being saved. A lot of the new versions actually use that. There's uh, one verse, I can't think of where it's at, but it says about are saved, and the new versions say are being saved. You know, why? Because the new versions come from the Vatican. So, use a King James and, you know, don't worry about your rewards being lost by the Lord. He's recording what you're doing. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Are you holding fast the form of sound words? You know, right now there's one of the big attacks against this King James Bible. They'll tell you that there are words that have changed meaning. A good one would be suffer. There are times when you'll read a verse in the King James and it says, I suffer not a woman to teach. And people go, see, suffer means today, it means it's, it's always that you're suffering, it's a bad thing. Whereas that verse, suffer means allow. And they say, see, so it should be changed, it should be updated. No, because our modern politically correct system has perverted King James Bible English, that doesn't mean that we ought to pervert the King James Bible to match our perverted culture. You know, they try to say, you know, let's, uh, I think that the wording of saying that man or mankind, you know, is, is offensive. And we should say people or persons or human beings, you know, let's do that instead because it's offensive. What are they doing? They're not holding fast the form of sound words. The politically correct system is mostly uh, the cause of feminism. Feminism is witchcraft. So you want to know where this modern PC terminology comes from. Predominantly, it's coming from witchcraft. And so why would we want to pervert God's holy word to match witchcraft? Like a lot of the modern churches do. They get up there and they don't want to offend people. And so they, they say, you know, it's good to have all, all you uh, 
brothers and sisters instead of saying brethren, you know. Or I look out at all the, the humanity instead of saying man, you know. See, hold fast the form of sound words, right? Don't be embarrassed by your King James Bible, right? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. Let's think about holding fast. Uh, very interesting in here. It says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. A lot of people say, you know, you, you King James only people, you're so stubborn, you're not willing to change. Amen? Yeah. You see when the Lord says stand, you know, in Ephesians chapter 6 there is given a Roman phalanx, you know, and those guys that have their shield, I guess, here, and their sword there, like that, you know, have their, well, this would be the sword, actually. They'd have their shield like this, their sword like that, or down here, and they hold those, they get in tight, and they hold those shields in close to each other like that, and they march against the enemy. Well, what happens if you have some guy who, they say, stand your ground, and this guy here takes off running, and he retreats? You know what? Now there's a hole in the line there. Now you get a problem. You're supposed to stand your ground as a Christian. Don't break ranks. Don't run off because things are getting really bad. Stand for the Word of God. Stand for salvation by Jesus Christ alone. You know, stand against the wickedness that's going on in the world right now. Stand against sodomy. Stand against contemporary Christian, excuse me, music. Stand against all, all that stuff. Stand. You say, well, maybe we could find some common ground. No. <laughs> I'm not interested in common ground with the enemy. All right? Not going to happen. You say, well, couldn't, there, couldn't we get to a point where we could get along with the enemy? No. You're dealing with the enemy, the, the commanding officer of our enemy, is a being named Satan. And he's not going to quit until he's put into the bottomless pit for the thousand years. And then he comes out and he leads another rebellion. And then the Lord destroys that rebellion and takes Satan and finally throws him into the lake of fire for all of eternity. But until then, he's not going to quit. Satan does not take time off. That's very important to remember. But uh, you say, have there been people that have quit on the Lord? Yeah. First John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19 says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You know, there's a lot of people like that. Years and years and years ago, they were going to conservative churches, you know. And they were, they were what you would call conservative Christians. And then as soon as the modern rock stuff came along, and as soon as the, all the other stuff came along, they departed. They left. And now, you talk to those same people that used to say that they were conservative, now they're totally liberal. And they hate you if you're conservative. They hate your stands as a Bible believer. They mock you. You know what happened? Well, they went out from us, but they were not of us. You know? I'm not talking about somebody that's just backslid a little bit and went, you know, and they're, they went and they visited some kind of thing and are, you know, kind of falling away a little bit. Some guy reads, a, you know, they, they stick for the King James and then they, somebody hands them James White and they get confused and they back off on the King James issue. And then later on they come back. I'm not talking about somebody like that. I'm talking about somebody that's been in that new modern system for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And they have no desire to ever become a Bible believer again. There's a big problem there. You say, what's the, what, how did it start? Well, they didn't hold fast the form of sound words. And a lot of preachers didn't hold fast the form of sound words. They gave up the King James Bible back years ago. Because they went off to, you know, 
I should say Christians, they go off to seminary and they come out as preachers and they have their mind warped by the professors in there and things. It's a shame. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. It says here, That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Notice Timothy wasn't supposed to keep himself in the ministry by his talents, by his skill, by his leadership qualities and his ability to get a good corporation going and, and really, you know, build a great work for the Lord and we can have 900 people in Sunday school every week. That wasn't how he was supposed to keep himself. It was by the Lord, okay? Under the keep by the Holy Ghost, it says there. The thing that was committed to him, he's to keep it by the Holy Ghost, not by his own skills. And what you have a lot of times is these guys, they get into these into these phallus houses, you know, church buildings. They get in there and they say, man, we got bills to pay and, you know, this place cost us, you know, half a million dollars and, and we got all these insurance premiums and all this other stuff. And every week I stand up and preach and I preach the truth of God's word and uh, I offend people and people leave and things. And I got to start doing something to get people in here. And, and so they drop the Holy Ghost off at the door and they say, just, you know, kind of stay out there and, you know, maybe you can come in occasionally, but, you know, I just want to have to, I'm going to have to do things the way the world does things, okay? You know, I'm going to have to do things the way the Catholics do it and the way the Methodists and who everybody else, you know. And that's what a lot of the brethren have done. And then they try to defend their system and say it's scriptural. Uh, <laughs> you can watch the uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist Catholicism videos if you want more info on that. Watch out for that whole movement. Second Timothy chapter 1 verses 15 through 18. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Interesting there that Paul named both good and bad Christians. You know, he didn't just say, well, I don't want to, you know, promote anybody else, you know, or something like that, you know, because I, I got my own little agenda or something. No, he promoted Ones Onesiphorus there. And, you know, he oftentimes would say about, you know, some of the other brethren and things that were doing great works for the Lord, and Paul would promote them. He would kind of lift them up. But then there were those people that were leaving Paul and were not um, no longer friends of the ministry. They were now starting to attack him. And, uh, you know, Paul was naming them. And a lot of times you have to do that. Why? Because those people can go out and a lot of times instead of them just saying, well, you know, Brian is doing his own thing, they'll actually go out and make videos attacking me. And, you know, I try not to, you know, be too rough on some of the brethren, but uh, there are times I just have to name names. I just have to tell people, watch out for that over there. Don't go over to that guy. Don't mess with him. Why? Well, because I'm trying to protect the brethren. That's why. It's not that I have some kind of a special little bone to pick and I have my pride's been hurt or something like that. No. Um, if, if somebody does kick me and it's just a matter of a disagreement and they go on and they do their own thing and they're, they don't waste time making a whole bunch of videos attacking me personally or something, okay, I'll, I'll just, whatever, I'll between them and the Lord and, you know, we'll work things out in eternity. Who cares? But if I know that they have some kind of a major problem, a major area where they're off doctrinally and where they can hurt other believers, I'm going to name them. I'm going to name them by name. I'm going to tell them, stay away from that guy. You know, Paul did it. We should do it. <clears throat> but it's interesting too there, you know, the thing about Paul writes about how that, uh, you know, he was in prison and things and, and he had, you know, talked about his chain earlier on there and, and he said about how that, you know, the one brother was not ashamed of that. And it's kind of interesting because I think a lot of times there are people that will really 
praise a preacher until that preacher starts getting some major persecution. And all of a sudden they kind of back away like, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be associated with that guy. You know, and one of the best examples of that that I've ever seen is uh, Peter Ruckman. Uh, Peter Ruckman has his issues. I don't defend 100% of what the man says, but I'll tell you what, you can learn the Bible from that guy. He knows the Word of God very well. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of people just hate his guts and they, they attack him and they tear him down and stuff. And I've seen a lot of Ruckmanites, you know, guys that learn from him, they'll get real quiet when Ruckman starts getting kicked. I remember I was sitting around with a bunch of uh, Baptists the one time and they were talking about Ruckman and they said, oh boy, he's such a blessing, he's such a blessing, but uh, I just can't recommend him to anybody because, you know, he's just, he's too controversial in it and it just upsets people and stuff. So I just, I don't recommend him because, you know, I don't, you know, he, he's just too nasty or something. And I thought, wait a second, if you're saying he's a blessing and then you're saying that you can't recommend him because he's too nasty and, and he's too controversial, that's, there's some hypocrisy there. There are some problems there. Uh, if you see a man that's doing some work for the Lord and he's not, you know, totally falls off the deep end doctrinally or something like that, defend that man. Don't be a coward. Don't back down. So that's going to be it for chapter one. Uh, we're going to continue here because I'm recording a few videos in a row. Uh, and these videos are going to show up weeks apart uh, because we have a lot of work to do right now. We're going to be uh, trying to get things built up in Maine so we can move there, bring our things there, and it's going to be a lot of work. But uh, the time is drawing near where we're going to be able to actually have our ministry headquarters set up on our own, well, in our, in our own area there. And it's not going to be on our own land, at least not right away, because we don't have electric, so that's a problem if you have big computers and things like we do. But, uh, you know, we're, we're finally going to be able to have a, the ministry set up the way it should be. And uh, that's really, really going to be a good thing. And at that point in time, then we're going to be able to really produce that much better. Uh, everything's been very chaotic here. Um, our time here in Pennsylvania, uh, just because, you know, nothing's organized. I, we can't organize permanently. Everything has to be temporary. So again, thank you everyone out there for your prayers. Thank you for your donations. Um, very much appreciated. And uh, please keep praying. Uh, we have a, a lot of driving to do. Um, 14, 15 hour drive from where we're at up to um, where we're going to be living. So that's that can be kind of trying at times. Um, but the Lord's been real good to us, and we're, we're uh, really enjoying the property that the Lord has given to us and uh, anxious to get back up there again. So, go ahead and airplane over. <laughs> Hello. Uh, anyways, we'll close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to pray for any saint of yours out there that is in ministry of some kind, whether it's it could just be even handing out tracts to, to people that they meet, witnessing to friends and family. Um, Lord, they're going to get kicked. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them strength in that time, that they would be able to stand up against those attacks and understand that the suffering that we go through in this life is nothing compared to the life that we have promised to us uh, in eternity. And we're going to return to this earth one day and we're going to rule and reign with you for a thousand years, Lord, and everything is going to make sense at that time. And um, there will be no more debate over whether you exist or not or debate over what your true word says. It's all going to be fixed up and we'll be in glorified bodies. And uh, we'll car carry out your orders, Lord, and I'm really looking forward to that time. So, Lord, I just pray that all those people out there that are listening would stand fast and that they would hold fast the form of sound words and they wouldn't back down. And um, I just pray, Lord, that you would give each of us opportunities to witness for thee. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
All right, that's it for chapter one of Second Timothy. We will see you in chapter two.